Good evening, everyone. Uh, I apologize for uh, the tardiness. Uh, we had to work out some things, but we are all set now. I uh, want to thank you for joining us for Thursday Bible study. Uh, Second Baptist members know we only had the 6 p.m. Uh, time of study. Given uh, the weather, we wanted to be safe. We didn't want anyone trying to uh, travel and the roads are not yet uh, salted and cleared out. Uh, from what I understand, they're a little bit safer now. But we thank you for joining us wherever you are. Hopefully you're safe and warm, feeling healthy. Uh, I'll say this again at the end, but want to again remind everyone that we do have an opportunity for vaccinations for everyone ages five and up on Saturday from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. This is in partnership with Bay County NAACP, as well as the Great Lakes Bay Health Centers. Also blessed to have a donation from the County Health Department of KN95 masks. And so uh, those will be available on Saturday as well. Want to thank our administration team, as well as uh, Health and Wellness Ministry for kind of helping us with this. And then there are other people uh, representing other ministries that have volunteered their time to serve on Saturday to do our best to uh, be gracious hosts. So again, we have that available on Saturday. Uh, we'll share more announcements uh, via the phone tree as usual. Let's say have a word of prayer and we'll get right into our session uh, for this evening. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to study together. We ask that your word goes forth and does that which you seek to accomplish and not return void. Bless us to continue to strive to be the church that you want us to be. Nothing more, nothing less. Help us to be a part of your perfect will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you and we praise you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're continuing our series called the Five Star Church. Tonight is session four. Uh, we're grateful for this fourth hour uh, that we've had together. We've gone through several chapters of the book. Um, just want to talk about tonight developing ministry teams. The last time we were together, we discussed uh, the fact that excellence is a process. We do have goals. We do have uh, goals we're trying to meet. However, we acknowledged and accept uh, that it's this ongoing process. This is something that in some sense will never be complete. However, we do have roles to play and things that God wants us to do, God wants us to accomplish as his church and therefore in our respective ministries. And not only in our respective ministries, but in our respective lives. And so uh, we want to embrace that it's a process and a piece of that process is ongoing development. And we know with development that speaks to growth, that speaks to assessment that speaks to awareness of this is where we are this is where we want to go uh, and in between and even after we get to in some sense where we want to go understanding accepting and even embracing the ongoing development because we not only want to do well in our lifetime but we want to leave a legacy that others have left for us here at second baptist we know this church has existed for nearly 140 years which means there have been a lot of people who God has touched and used in this community and in this church for this church to still be here. And so uh, we want to be a part of that lasting legacy that Second Baptist exists and exists as a church known for excellence in all the areas that God wants his church to have that excellence based on his holy word for as many years as God wants it to be and hopefully all the way until the time that Jesus returns back to get us. So tonight, as we talk about developing ministry teams, we really only want to look at two areas, or two areas that make up teams. Number one, it is for quality teams, we want to have quality members. Let's start in Exodus chapter 18. In Exodus chapter 18, there's a story there where Jethro visits Moses. Jethro is Moses' father-in-law, uh, if you know the story, Moses met his wife Zipporah uh, in Africa uh, where he was um, uh, tending some sheep. Uh, he was actually he was traveling away from Egypt 
and he found uh, she and her sisters tending some sheep and he helped uh, save them from a situation. He met her, the family cared for him, and over time he and Zipporah got married and Moses went to obey his calling on his life and at some point uh, she was went back to her family and their children went back to hang out with their family and Jethro brought the family to where Moses and the children of Israel were. Jethro sees what goes on and according to verses 7 through 8 there it appears as though um, uh, Jethro uh, became uh, saved. He uh, believed in God and God used Jethro's life expertise and he was able to see with his wisdom and expertise and experience some things that Moses could be doing better and that was developing a team of people to serve with him to serve everybody and what Jethro mentions is that not only would it benefit the people but it would benefit Moses himself that takes me back to in some shape form or fashion uh, something that we notice in the Lord's Prayer when Jesus teaches us how to pray there's no I me or my in that prayer it's we us and our and an interesting thing, when we, us, and our are taken care of, I, me, and my are taken care of as well. And a piece of that is what Jesus telling us, and we see it throughout Jesus' life, is to focus on the welfare and well-being of everybody, not just ourselves. Because when everyone's well-being and welfare is taken care of, particularly when we have the right motives, we are doing it from our faith. We're doing it from our love of God and understanding what Jesus did for us. Then God promises through Jesus to provide for all of our needs. And that is in essence what is even concealed and revealed here in Exodus chapter 18. And that's what Jethro tells him. Moses listened to what he says and notice what happens uh, in developing at every level of service. Listen to verses 24 and 25. I encourage you to read the entire chapter. But listen to verse 24 and 25. Moses listened to his father-in-law and did everything he said. He chose capable men from all Israel and made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Verse 26, they served as judges for all the people at all times. The difficult cases they brought to Moses, but the simple ones they decided themselves. Now, we know we hear judges and that may sound uh, kind of harsh, but really what he's saying is they were able to lead in all of those areas. But before Moses did this, Moses was leading all of these people and reading the details and the context. There were hundreds of thousands of people traveling with the children of Israel. So Moses was taking it upon himself adding all of this stress on himself, all of this long days of working and all of this, and he didn't need to be. Moses thought he had to do all of that until his father-in-law came and offered him a word of wisdom. And Moses was like, you know what, you're right. Now, it did take Moses taking the time to impart some principles on these leaders and developing these leaders. But Moses was doing some things himself. And what this shows us is that it's never good to just do stuff ourselves. We should be sharing and depositing what we are learning into others. Uh, in the churches I've served in previous to coming to Second Baptist, I've had conversations with people when the time comes uh, to, to transition their service. Notice something in Scripture. You'll never see anywhere where anyone retires. Retirement is not in Scripture. Now, I'm not talking about retirement from a job or from a career. I'm referring to a retirement of service. And we look at the spiritual gifts, and we look at that in depth later on this year. Those spiritual gifts are for you and I to serve God and God's people as long as we're on earth. How and where we serve may change, but we're always called to serve. And so Moses knew he needed this help. There's this wisdom that Jethro offered, and although Jethro was not serving in the same capacity, Jethro had some experience in administration, and he let him know in some way from wisdom, you're doing too much, you're working too hard. For you and I, that helps us understand 
that maybe I can't do physically what I once used to do, but I can deposit into other people what I learned in serving in that regard. Give an example, if I'm an usher or I used to be an usher, maybe I'm no longer able to stand on the door, but there's something I can offer from my years of service and ushering to current ushers and maybe future ushers. And you can sub in any area of gifting, any area of talent, whether it's in the church or not, uh, because there's really no separation when it comes to our faith, to secular and spiritual or secular and sacred. Jesus never made that distinction, so you and I never make that distinction either. We live it out all the time. We are, maybe we're not doing what we used to do, how we used to do it, but we can at least be training someone else for it. Sharing what we learn, sharing even the mistakes that sometimes that's wisdom is sharing some information so that people don't make some of the mistakes that we made earlier on in our lives. And there are ways and so many different ways that we can do that. So there's always a way for us to serve. Again, the Bible never talks about retirement. And that is because you and I are always called to serve as long as God allows us to live here on earth. But that's what that Exodus 18 passage is about, development for all levels of service. And I would even say all times of service. Then we turn to Proverbs 27 and 17. Even when we talk about uh, uh, not necessarily using committees, but more so having teams. We know with committees, we have uh, people in certain leadership positions, and the leader can kind of make all of the decisions and all of that. Uh, but at times, it's best, we have to discern these times, but at times it's better just to have a team of people discussing and coming to an agreement, considering different vantage points, considering different points of views, considering as uh, many options as we can as we come to a decision. Here's how Proverbs 27 and 17 says it. As iron sharpens iron, one person sharpens another. Of course, we have to have the right disposition, the right attitude, the openness to hearing what other people have to say. And I believe what helps us do that, a conviction that I have that the Lord has given me through different circumstances, is the same Holy Spirit that's living in me is the same Holy Spirit that's living in you, and you, and you, and you. And so when we remember that, we can listen to what other people have to say. If there needs to be some, some massaging or some molding into making sure we're in line with scripture, that's fine. But again, if, the, if we all believe in the same Jesus, that means we all have the same Holy Spirit inside of us. That means everybody has something to offer. And we have to have that openness, that disposition to have some conversations because maybe it's not going to sound exactly how we would say it or how we want to hear it, but there's probably something that can be helpful in that moment if that person's a part of that ministry, if that person's a part of the church. So we have to have that openness uh, to learn that. Then turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We, we looked at this chapter in a couple of verses in previous sessions, but today when we're looking at verses 9 and 10, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, it says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. That is, if we're working by ourselves and we make a mistake, then we got to clean it up ourselves. Maybe you've been by yourself like I have and I made a mistake and then I got to make that phone call to get help when I should have made the phone call to get help before I even started. You know, t two heads are better than one is, is the cliche. And that is one of this, these truths that uh, the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, if we begin to work the process with multiple people, then that usually helps us not make as many mistakes as we go throughout the process or we do the ministry initiative or we try to live out scripture. If we have an accountability partner with us when it comes to that, we have, if it's a ministry approach, then the ministry should be involved in how we approach it. And that is what that is saying. But you and I have been in that position to where we tried to do something ourselves and had to make that phone call, didn't want to make the phone call, probably put off making the phone call. Uh, particularly, we know somebody was going to say, well, why didn't you call me to help you from the beginning? And typically, that also involves making us work harder when we really want to work smarter. 
that is a piece of achieving this excellence that we're going for. And then Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, uh, we know this. But we want to hear it again. Uh, it's about gathering. As we go there, something that I've noticed uh, as we approach two years in this pandemic um, and, and wrestling with how to do, as we're doing now, virtual the virtual space, uh, trusting that God can even consecrate the virtual space, that we have to be careful that we don't limit uh, how God can, can work, how God can speak. Uh, listen to what it says, and I'll say more about the verse 24 of chapter 10 of the book of Hebrews. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, there was a time where I can admit, and even myself personally, I didn't agree uh, with uh, virtual church streaming service. Uh, and the way it was put to me by my pastor is that anywhere the devil is communicating, we have to share the gospel. And I agree with that, of course. But this pandemic has put it even to more perspective. And I noticed in reading that it doesn't say where we gather. It just says that we should gather. Something I've been blessed to see is in the comment section how people are able to continue to share in a worship experience and encourage each other, put names in for a prayer list and even join the church and all of that. I even had conversations with people who uh, have, have felt the spirit move in their own home to where they were in tears, where they were shouting at home, even as the worship experience was going on. There have been people who have been saved who we're not going to church in person, but now they're going virtually. They've been saved. They're engaged in Bible study. They're engaged in other ways of ministry. And we're even forced to consider in different ways how to continue doing ministry in the current situation that include, includes virtually. But I noticed that about that text. It says to gather, but it leaves that space. And that's because, again, this pandemic did not catch Jesus by surprise. And so Jesus knew way back then that we were going to be revealed this peace about his holy word uh, that he even made these. And the people that had the ideas for streaming and all of that, whether they realize it or not, I believe God gave them that idea and gave them the tools to figure out how to stream for such a time as this and going forward. And we know that spending time together, it enhances relationships. We have even shifted. It's not the same, but we have even shifted to having family Zoom conversations, uh, birthday celebrations, and uh, we FaceTime people on our phones and all of that, and we still have a sense of community with it. Again, it's not necessarily the same, but we're still able to foster that community. We've been able to have Zoom Sunday school at Second Baptist for this two years and service and all that. We've continued to be able to do that, and we've seen God's blessings, and I believe a part of that is our faithfulness to sticking with it in new ways but sticking with it. And that is how we come together. We have community. We foster community. And as we do these, and there's other scriptures that can piece to this, but it's about being a part of a team. There's no I in team, as they say. And it, as we remember, and perhaps other people learn, that we're all on the same team, and then we can let go of some competitiveness. We can let so let go of some some uh, proclivities we have to thinking uh, this ministry is superior to that ministry or because I've been faithful this long, I'm superior. This will help us to remember that Jesus came for everybody. Jesus invites everybody. Jesus encourages everybody. And so that you and I do that as well. And that can help us work as a team. Now, as we work as a team, you see that next bullet there, that from the team, from the members, is where leaders emerge. We look at that Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. Not going to read it, that's a long passage, but that is the passage about, it's called the parable of the talents. And Jesus being the master teacher that he is, he uses that word talents uh, as, as a double entendre, as they call it in English language, in your lot of language classes. That is, he used that word talent to be a balance between uh, the investment of money, of time, and yes, our talents, and yes, our gifts. Sometimes talents and gifts are different. 
I believe when Jesus is saying here, he's referencing our spiritual gift that Paul would really flesh out later on. But they knew what he was talking about because they knew the scripture to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your soul. That is to love God with your entire being, to serve God with your entire being, and therefore to serve all people with your entire being. And that parable, it talks about seriously taking this time we have on earth, Seriously taking this talent that God has given us and seriously taking the resources that God blesses us with and investing it into the things of God. And he talks about with each of these people, the different levels of investment and seriousness in which they had elicited different responses from Jesus and therefore different blessings. You know, we live in a day and time where we have to be cognizant of God does not have favorites and all of that. However, we do know from Scripture that there is going to come a time with judgment that we are to give account for what we did and did what we did do on earth. Now, it, it's, Scripture suggests that we won't be uh, we won't be necessarily penalized for what we didn't do, but we will be rewarded for what we did do. That is, if we go before the judgment seat of Christ. He's not going to say, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you didn't do this. He's not going to do that. But what he is going to do is, you did do this, you did do this, you did do this. And so that is a motivation, uh, secondary, the primarily just our love of Christ. We know what Jesus did for us, we know what Jesus does for us, and that motivates us to live. But we also have that motivation, understanding that he is paying attention to everything that we do, how we live for him and for other people. And what that passage is saying, if you invest in the things of me, I'm going to invest in you. And if, you, if I can trust you with the little bit I give you, then I'm going to continue to trust you with more, not only on earth, but also later on in heaven. And so what happens in an application for this, in particular with excellence, is that when we are invested in the kingdom and the way we show that in some ways is how we're invested in the church that God sends us to, is we will emerge as leaders in the eyes of other people. Uh, we'll see this in our church book in a few weeks, but we're going to follow this model of leadership. We already know if people are leaders or not by way of their service and presence in the life of the church. We already know who those leaders are. Now, whether or not they have a title, may or may not have titles, but we know who leaders are. We know this not only in the church, but otherwise, there has to be some credibility in how a person lives, and that's going to dictate where you and I follow them. Political year in Michigan, election year in Michigan, I should say. And when we consider who we're voting for, we're going to look at their platform. We're going to look at their voting record. If, if this is their first time running for an elected office, we're going to look at, okay, where did they work before? What industries did they work in? What did they do? How long have they worked there? And that is going to determine credibility or lack thereof with that person. And in a higher, holier level that happens in God's kingdom and in his church. Same thing goes with the process that is used in selecting a pastor. We have a resume that we have to present. We have sermons we have to give and, and Bible studies. And that determines interest in whether or not that pastor is going to serve as a shepherd for a particular church credibility and the same goes for every other place in the church is whether or not people are truly invested in the church because if you're not invested into the church if it's not just coming from your heart then we're not going to we're going to not give you the title because then you you're just trying to do it for the title and not the betterment of the church that's the biblical model of leadership and it emerges from that investment in the kingdom which is partially through the church all right, move on to that John chapter 10, verses 1 through 5 and verses 11 through 14. Here's where Jesus makes one of his seven I am statements, or two of them actually, where he says that he is the good shepherd, he's also the gate for the sheep. Uh, but he makes this statement about under shepherds. And we know any of us who live and serve and we have influence with other people, we, in some sense, are under shepherds because we don't own anything, as we talked about in previous sessions. We are stewards. And the people we have, parents, we are stewards of those children God has blessed us with. Those of us who have homes, we're stewards of that house and of the property. 
Those of us who have spouses, we're stewards of those spouses. And you can apply this in different ways. But Jesus mentions that there's there's some under shepherds who's supposed to be serving. If you look at verses 11 through 14, it says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The person who runs or runs away because he is a hired hand cares nothing for the sheep. All of us have had people in our lives uh, that, that when it got rough and tough, they were nowhere to be found. When stuff got challenging, call them, they wouldn't pick up the phone. But then when they needed you, they had no problem with their phone working. And we can come up with other examples that we've seen. People are not, the, some people are not dependable. What Jesus is saying, number one, I am dependable. And number two, people who are really my sheep, who really love me, who I really appointed to serve because they, they really love me and their service is showing that, those are dependable people. And we saw some things throughout this pandemic that revealed that in the church and otherwise, of whether or not people are dependable, whether or not people are serious about their faith in Jesus, whether or not people are serious about living for God, because life has gotten and is rough in new ways that none of us ever expected in this pandemic. And we've been able to see some things to help us to have that discernment. And so what Jesus is saying is, you know, as leaders with an investment piece, leaders will show themselves when, when the tough get going, the rough get going, whether or not they really are leaders, whether or not they really are believers in Christ and servants in Christ. Then we have one more example to show that and show this consistency. And that's Acts chapter six, verses one through seven. We spent time there last year. And there's a story here where people's needs were not being met practically. And the leaders of the early church noticed it, they acknowledged it, and the way they remedied it was they asked the people to select among themselves leaders to be a part of meeting that need. Says it there, uh, verse 3, entire passages 1 through 7, verse 3 says, Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. The proposal pleased the whole group and they chose and you see the names of the people they chose. That is, the leaders were already apparent. They knew who had already been leading even though they didn't have the title. True leaders will lead and serve without having a title. True leaders will lead and serve and not always have to be financially compensated for what they're doing. Their names don't have to be called. They don't have to be put out there. They don't have to be recognized. When true leaders are leaders, they're already leading. They're already present. They're already giving of their time, talent, and treasure. They're already trying to be a part of the betterment of people and the betterment of the kingdom as a whole. They're already taking care of the building, taking care of the property. They're already looking for ways to serve. They already have the right disposition. And then we put them in places of leadership. That is a major piece of excellence being cultivated and not just sustained and maintained, but being developed in others. Because you and I know people. Think of the history of this church, history of your family. We know people who were servants know people who were leading, know people who we trust. And those are people who are doing it out of their love for Christ. And from their love for Christ, then they have a love for the church and the kingdom of God. And it shows itself. That is a major piece of developing because, again, these leaders come from members in the membership who are already serving. They're already leading and then they get the title. And that, again, is not only how excellence is maintained and sustained, but how it's developed long term. So here's a statement of summation, and we're done for tonight. God gives his body the right parts. There's no such thing as a wrong person, only wrong positions. 
All right? It is God's desire not only that each and every one of us are saved and then that we join the church that God wants us to be a part of, but God also wants us to serve in places of ministry in the church. As we talked about at the beginning of this series, we'll probably have new ministries developed. It's also our prayer that people who are in the wrong ministries get in the right ministries such that the church can be better, and when the church is better, then the community can be served better. And that's, that's what all I've been trying to say tonight. All I believe these scriptures point to is that it's about developing the membership, and from the membership, the leaders will show themselves. And a part of us having integrity is being honest that, you know what? I've served here, I've done my best to serve here, but I need to serve in a different place. I've even served as a leadership. Maybe it's time for me to serve in a different way to help cultivate some new leadership. But for all of us, it is a, it is a time to, to consider how can I be a part of the kingdom of God being excellent. And you and I who are at Second Baptist, how we can do that here at Second Baptist to be a blessing to the rest of the membership and us join together to be a blessing to the community and wherever else God wants us to be a blessing too. I haven't seen any questions online. Do we have any questions in person? Okay. If you do have questions, put them in the comment section. I'll be glad to go back and take a look at them and do my best to answer them. Uh, but developing ministry teams. We're using that word developing on purpose. It's in the present perfect tense because it's always something we want to do. All right. So again, thank you so much for joining us. Let's continue to keep each other safe, wear our mask, do our, our physical distancing. If you're not uh, vaccinated, prayerfully consider being vaccinated. And we're doing our part with that on Saturday. Again, we have an opportunity to be host in partnership with the Bay County NAACP, Great Lakes Bay Health Center. We have a clinic for vaccines for anyone ages five and up, first dose, second dose, and booster shots. Then we also are blessed to have some KN95 masks available uh, from the Bay County Health Department. We'll be giving those out on Saturday as well. So feel free to come out uh, and get whichever shots you need as we continue to uh, protect ourselves and each other. I love you. We invite you down to the clinic on Saturday, but join us on Sunday at noon. We're going to begin our seven last saying series as we uh, begin to go into um, uh, the season where we culminate in Resurrection Sunday, uh, we're going to look at um, the seven last sayings of Jesus, uh, how they can impact discipleship, the importance of, of how, why Jesus said what he said as he was dying for you and dying for me. Again, I love you. Continue to stay safe. Stay safe traveling if you're in mid-Michigan. Uh, we'll see you this weekend. Take care.